Great. So as folks are joining, thank you for dropping in the chat where you're joining from, if you already garden and something you're hoping to learn or something that you found interesting about tonight's class. I will get us started and introduce Urban Harvest for folks who maybe are new to our organization. So we have been gardening for good, as we like to say, in Houston since 1994. Our founders um, included Dr. Bob Randall, who has a, a fantastic book about gardening in Metro Houston and lots of good information there. We have been working in communities. If this wants to advance, I will wait. Uh, we've been working in communities in our schools uh, since 1994, improving and en enhancing education through the outdoor classroom. So learning hands-on, teaching kids how to grow their own food, um, and cultivate thriving communities through gardening and access to healthy local food. And you can see there, our core values are integrity, empowerment, sustainability, and equity, working to make sure that our uh, community members, community gardeners are able to be set up with resources that they need in order to continue to grow food for their community members. And if you have not visited already, highly encourage uh, you to check out the largest farmer's market in the Houston region with fresh seasonal veggies, unique artisanal products. There's new vendors being added um, almost all the time. It seems like we have over 90 local vendors who are there every Saturday morning, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. on off of Buffalo Speedway. Um, and we also teach over 60 organic gardening classes every year. So this is our basic courses, two series, uh, specialty classes like this one, workshops and permaculture in vegetable, organic vegetable certification. So check out our website for more information. Uh, we support over 140 gardens throughout the greater Houston area that spans from Galveston to Magnolia. So a huge area with lots of diverse gardens with opportunities to get involved uh, potentially near you where you live. And as I mentioned, we expose Houston area youth to the wonders of gardening and the natural world, knowing where their food comes from, we believe is hugely important for the development of those young minds and bodies. Um, and then our one of our newest programs, the Food Access Program, is promoting healthy, fresh food in communities that do not have access, usually historically marginalized communities. And uh, we do that through our mobile farmer's markets, refrigerated van that allows us to bring farmer's markets to those communities. So you are welcome to grow with us, volunteer with us, visit us at the market at an event or class uh, near you, sign up for our monthly newsletter and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. We would love to have you to be part of our community and grow with us. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Roy Vu, uh, who earned his PhD in 2006 in history at the University of Houston. He is now a history professor at Dallas College in Irving, Texas. And he also serves as an advisory board member for Planet Forward Farms and Food Waste Texas. And he's currently writing a book titled Farm to Freedom, Vietnamese Americans and Their Home Gardens under contract for publication with Texas A&M Press. And him and his wife reside in Irving, Texas. We are very excited to have him here. And also if you did not get to read his article in the Edible Houston, I highly recommend that you check that out. Otherwise, I will pass things off to you, Dr. Roy. And thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Megan. And thank you for the lovely introduction. I appreciate it. You, you made me sound really, really good, um, more than it is, but nevertheless, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you, uh, Carol Byrne and Urban Harvest for inviting me to present today. It's a privilege to be here and it's an honor to, to speak uh, to the Urban Harvest uh, audience. Uh, and this is uh, just um, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to not only talk a little bit more about uh, Garney, but also talk about uh, the Vietnamese spread of cheese and the Vietnamese American, Vietnamese Americans in Texas and uh, how they would cultivate backyard gardens uh, to get access to fresh fruits, herbs, and vegetables, and also build uh, build a piece of homeland for themselves uh, as they continue to nurture, heal, uh, and recover from the traumas of war, refuge, and resettlement. Additionally, before I begin my paper presentation, I wish to acknowledge uh, as Vietnamese American born and raised in Houston, and with Vietnamese refugees as refugee settlers, that I'm humbled to be born and raised on indigenous land, home of the Akwakisa Indians. I hope my presence will not be a disturbance, but rather my personal start to action for indigenous people's rights. With that hope in mind, I began my presentation, and I wish to start with a quote from food historian uh, Mark uh, Pendupat. So his quote, uh, 
food culture is but one example of how practices of everyday life are often critical to how people make sense of the world around them, where they fit into that world, who should belong in that world, and how they imagine to remake these worlds, uh, end of quote. And uh, this quote uh, comes from uh, one of his books, Flavors of Empire, um, Food in the Make of Thai America. And I highly recommend it. So uh, please do check out his work. Uh, in regards to um, Mark, Mark Winnipeg's quote, it reflects on the quotidian or daily practices uh, that shape reality, where food and where food culture grants immigrants, refugees alike, an opportunity to seek home and gain a level of belonging uh, in a foreign United States on their own terms. Immigrants are just come over their world by growing, producing, cooking, and consuming their own foods. They can also create their own spaces of belonging with emancipatory foodways by cultivating home gardens replete with herbs, fruit trees, and vegetables. Challenging uh, the process of resettlement and complete assimilation, Binbi's text and home gardens, gardeners, excuse me, produce homegrown food to nurture their minds and bodies, remember the past, retain and strengthen their Vietnamese culture, and pursue healthier means of living. In gardening, they explore and discover a homeland duality, free of perpetual statelessness and rootlessness. Home gardens become an essential grounded connection to their lost homeland, their ghost country of Vietnam, more specifically South Vietnam. For Vietnamese Texans, their gardening practices preserve and expand the food waste through the herbs, vegetables, and fruits they cultivated, which are then utilized as essential ingredients for traditional dishes to be shared and consumed. By replanting their roots here in the Texas soil and raising bountiful home gardens, Vietnamese Texans cultivate ties to Vietnam they remember so that future generations may enjoy the fruits of their labor. By replanting their Vietnamese culture and identity with their home gardens and produce, Vietnamese Texans demonstrate greater food security, sovereignty, and heritage. While Vietnamese Texans grow and work on their home gardens as a coping mechanism and form of healing, the labor, time, effort, and consumption of produce nurture their physical and mental health, offering, cultural, uh, offering culture continuity to construct an identity, build community, and resist the marginalization of Vietnamese culture in the United States. From refuge to recovery, to reclamation, and finally redemption, home gardens provide Vietnamese Texan gardeners another roadmap to survive, live, and in some cases thrive, while enduring, confronting, and living with the traumas of war, refuge, displacement, and racialization. And this tradition goes all the way back to Vietnam in regards to Vietnamese Texans and what they cultivated. They many of them had their own ki uh, kitchen gardens back in Vietnam before the war and during the war. Uh, in regards to South Vietnam, um, it's uh, formerly known as Republic of Vietnam, but co colloquially uh, among uh, the Vietnamese diaspora, it's better known as South Vietnam. And I just want to show you a few stamps um, that uh, uh, demonstrate uh, the Vietnamese um, passion for uh, cultivating and consuming uh, fruits and, and vegetables. So here's uh, a, a number, here are a number of old uh, stamps from the former Republic of Vietnam, South Vietnam. Uh, you see a variety of uh, fruits and vegetables, you know, such as bitter melons and uh, soursop and so forth. And in terms of Vietnamese refugees themselves, uh, you would see how uh, they would uh, continue to cultivate gardens, even in spaces uh, that they uh, would live temporarily or uh, may not be welcome. And I'm referring to the refugee camps throughout Southeast Asia, camps that were established after the war. And so you have Vietnamese refugees from the first wave, uh, sorry, 1975, to the second uh, and third waves who arrived around the United States in the um, early 1980s and throughout that decade and into the early 1990s. Um, between Vietnam and the United States, uh, many of them would uh, reside in these refugee camps, such as this one from Malaysia, some for several months and some for several years. As you can see, they would cultivate their own gardens as they uh, wait um, for months, sometimes even years to see if they would uh, uh, gain permission uh, to gain political asylum to resettle in places like the United States. Nevertheless, uh, in the time between, uh, they would cultivate these gardens to not only uh, have access to fresh fruits, herbs, and vegetables, but also uh, to remember what they left behind, uh, the country that they fled uh, by force. All right. 
so moving on to uh, Vietnamese uh, Texans and their gardens and what they grow in Texas. For Vietnamese Texan home gardeners, um, they recall their gardening practices while growing up in Vietnam and learning from their parents. Uh, for instance, uh, Nguyen Van Nam learned how to garden while growing up in Vietnam, helping his mother uh, in the front and backyards. Uh, Nguyen reflects, quote, um, back home in North Vietnam, when I was little, my father was the only one working. My mother stayed home, taking care of the house, watching the children, going to the market nearby to get food, preparing the meals, and working in the garden when she had time. We had a big backyard with fruit trees and a bigger front yard for vegetables. Uh, when my sister and I came home from school, we tried to do our homework and study our lessons first. If we still had time, we went to the front yard to help mom. I learned from mom how to use a forward rate. I also learned how to plant different kinds of vegetables and how to take care of them. With hope. Other Vietnamese texts also remember the gardening days in Vietnam at the time of the second wave of Exodus. Uh, Huang Quang and his wife, Nguyen Lan, resettled in 1985. Huang Quang learned to garden as a four year old child growing up in Vietnam. The oldest son and offspring, Sun Huang, uh, remarks, uh, that, excuse me, that quote, my dad inherited my grandfather and great grandfather's love of working on land. And a quote, uh, back to it, Pham of Fort Worth, Texas, because she was born in the southern Vietnam countryside, where it was natural and common knowledge to learn how to garden and plant trees by traditional practices. Growing up in Vietnam, Tammy Din reflects her childhood home in Hue, where they lived in a spacious residence with a huge garden and abundance of farm animals. She recalls, quote, my parents' home was like a zoo. They cultivated a big garden. They had a, they had a farm full of animals, chickens, pigs, ducks, rabbits, and more, end of quote. She also mentions the various fruit trees her parents would plant and nurture in their yard, turning in a bounty of delicious fruits, uh, such as papayas, small sweet bananas, sweet sops, and, uh, sh or sugar apples. Um, for these American home gardeners, digging into the soil, planting seeds, and nurturing uh, plants to grow, or acts of healing that they also help them, that also help them remember their homeland and preserve their cherished food waste. Uh, scholar Wing Ying Shu finally writes that, quote, the desire for a home generates its revision and idealization, motivating endless search for and invention of the origin. And quote, Shu pointedly observes that food waste are tangible and strong emotional pools that aid exiles and refugees to seek and find home home they long for and one they must be more to, to remain afloat and steady themselves from the gale-like storms of war, abandonment, survivor guilt, and displacement. Not surprisingly, for Vimy's refugees, political asylees, and exiles, the food waste lead to home. Thus, their home gardens take on more than one meaning. Such home gardens contain layers of meanings as it evokes powerful memories, connections, and food waste for Vimy's diasporans who cultivate familiar produce and then wash and prepare them to make their comfort food of traditional culinary, I'm uh, sorry, these dishes to cultivate familiar produce and then wash and prepare them to make their comfort food of traditional culinary dishes. What they produce and preserve from their home gardens are essential to keep and extend their Vietnamese food waste. Sun Huang provides a detailed account of what his parents, Nguyen Lan and Huang Quang, grew from the spacious backyard of their now former Caroline home. Some remember such an avid gardener, while his mother would partake gardening after her husband. Well, my dad grew all sorts of trees, pears, peaches, lemons, uh, and more. On the other hand, my mom did not take up planting until we moved off the land and into a parallel subdivision. I guess to her, planting and managing a 7,000 square feet lot is much easier than two acres. Since retirement, they have been planting and growing both decorative and practical gardens each year, improving on their techniques and craft. They're able to crossbreed the fruits and vegetables to achieve the sweetest kumquats and graft plants to produce seedless oranges. Life uh, in Paraland came home for both of my parents because they never imagined living elsewhere. And of quote. As for son's mother, Lan, she enjoys thinking of these beautiful plants as the product of her hard work and appreciates that the fresh produce strains and improves their health. His father, uh, Quang, strongly believes that gardening helps him remember the past, connecting them with a previous life in Vietnam. They both find gardening a nurturing daily activity that not only reduces stress, but provides a connection to nature. Huang explains, quote, gardening makes you live close to nature, it makes life more beautiful, end of quote. Lan uh, would add, uh, quote, it's also good for our relationship because it gives us things to do together, end of quote. Now in 2020, they did relocate once more, this time moving to a home closer to Houston's de facto Little Saigon along Bel Air Boulevard in west of Beltway 8. 
uh, here, um, just to briefly go over some of these main points. So the double meaning of home gardens, right? Home not only in terms of cultivating uh, herbs, fruit trees, and, and vegetables in their uh, home yards, but also uh, a reconnection to their homeland of Vietnam. And so you had this double meaning of home garden. So as they're trying to make a home for themselves here in the United States, they're also remembering their home of Vietnam. And then some common vegetables, herbs, fruit trees grown uh, in Vietnamese American home gardens. You have water spinach, raw moon, um, uh, variety of mints, raw tom, okra, da bop, winter melons, beet al, um, mustard uh, greens, azirkai, chili peppers, gaya, and papayas, doo doo, and, and so on. So quite a few um, uh, herbs, gardens, and fruit trees that they would cultivate. Uh, and in regards to uh, some of the quotes, which I, I've already mentioned, uh, for Win Van Nam, um, quote, this is an effort to preserve and extend the traditions of our ancestors. In regards to Huang Guan, uh, quote, gardening makes you live close to nature, it makes life more beautiful. Uh, end of quote. All right, so moving on. Um, speaking of my parents now, uh, after moving a couple of times in Pasadena, Texas, my parents, Jen uh, Zim Zoom and Vu Gienangkwan took their four children, finally settled in what would be our family home for the next 40 years. My parents still reside in this very house with its humble appearance, location, and a working class neighborhood of Southeast Houston. But surrounded This modest abode is where they will see there's many other vegetables, herbs, and fruit trees that finally remember back in Vietnam. Interestingly, they did not plant home gardens when our family first lived in Pasadena during the first few years of settlement. It was not until we moved into our unassuming three bedroom house and settled in the South Belt neighborhood where my parents started to raise a home garden. This is where they began to feel at home, and the garden year after year would produce refreshing and delicious greens, fruits, and herbs. My parents also plucked and prepared their homegrown fresh. Uh, the homegrown, fresh, and organic crops to make a variety of Vietnamese dishes familiar and comforting to them. Growing up in our humble dwelling in Southeast Houston, I had a cursory interest in what my parents grew. I neither understood nor gave much thought as to why they would grow squash and, be and peach trees. At the time, I could not exactly comprehend what they were practicing was considered garden to table. Since so planting fruit trees and vegetables was what I thought just a daily passe ritual for them. I did not truly appreciate their recreational gardening to be organic and healthy in more ways than one. As a young adult, uh, what began to be my curiosity was that even though our family printing, printing business was struggling, we had to live rather frugally, uh, my parents continued to raise fruit trees, chili peppers, and okra squash, yet they gave away most of what they cultivated to relatives, friends, and fellow churchgoers. I was completely unaware of the communal act that they shared with other Vietnamese historians. Like so many of their kinsmen and kinswomen, the working class struggles, my parents were always willing to literally share the fruits of their labor to others. So what was their reward? Well, for certain, my parents take great pleasure and a little pride watching their vegetables and fruit trees grow. For them, gardening is not a business venture, but a leisure activity joy. Like uh, Huang Guang, Win Lan, and many other Vietnamese American home gardeners, they give their fresh produce to their own children, relatives, and friends. Perhaps equally important, my father believes that gardening gives them, quote, a greater sense of our mother country, end of quote. Additionally, much like other Vietnamese American home gardeners, my parents compost with food scraps and spoiled leftovers, using them as a natural fertilizer to enrich the garden soil. For my mother, having an organic and sustainable home garden brings her joy. She believes that the physical exertion of gardening and spending some time outdoors will make a person stronger and healthier too. Chen Ti Lung, uh, my mother-in-law, uh, and her two daughters uh, were living in Duncanville, a suburb city south of Dallas, when she finally got to see her husband again. In 1991, after more than 15 years of separation, Chen Ti Le reunited with her husband, Fan Min Tu, and her mother-in-law. Tu had been detained by Vietnamese communists and forced to live in re-education camps because of his political affiliation with the Republic of Vietnam, uh, as mentioned, better known as South Vietnam. A year after their reunion, uh, the family relocated to Duncanville home with a sizable backyard. The spacious yard made Lung happy because she could expand her garden and plant persimmon trees and more vegetables. In 2003, the family moved once more, reselling in a new subdivision, Grand Prairie, where Lung and her husband would grow mint leaves, perilla, lemongrass, chives, cilantro, water spinach, uh, lufa, bitter melon, and summer squash. Despite some challenges to gardening under the blazing Texas sun and stifling heat during the long summer months, Lung believes it is a worthwhile endeavor. Those are the vegetables, herbs, and fruits that she cultivates. Lung articulates, quote, when I put Vietnamese veggies, herbs, fruits uh, in my mouth, that is very special to me. When I eat them, I feel like I have Vietnamese spirit in my mouth. 
They all taste so good, to me, especially the food from my garden. Gardening is for relaxation after a long day of working or to see the new day with new things growing in the backyard. But the best is to share with our friends and relatives, end of quote. One of Lung's gardening friends is uh, Bak uh, with Pham, uh, whom I mentioned earlier. She currently resides in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, Bak recalls how she raised the home garden of her own. She reflects on her early days of resettlement and why uh, she started gardening. I believe I have a photo. Of, well, um, I'll, I'll go through the photos um, in just a moment, but I do have a photo of, uh, of Bak with Pham. Uh, so to continue, uh, for Bak with Pham, she reflects on her early days of resettlement and why she started gardening. Quote, I never thought that I would grow vegetables myself. But when I came to America, I saw many Vietnamese families growing their own vegetables for their backyard garden. It was fun and most convenient to have herbs available for cooking. So I started gardening from my early days in America. Quote, she considers chili peppers and a variety of mints as indispensable in Vietnamese American home gardens. Uh, Bach also believes that most Vietnamese Americans, at a minimum, grow a few herbs and some chili peppers, greens and produce that do not require preparation and could be consumed raw. In the summer, she cultivates an assortment of vegetables and herbs, including basil, gorilla, lemongrass, endives, spinach, squash, and a variety of gourds. She also raises an array of uh, fruit trees, like mandarin oranges and passion fruit. In wintertime, her gardening options are limited, so she grows scallions or green onions. Baca understands that while home gardening has no financial reward and consumes enormous time and energy, it does bring numerous health and mental benefits. She declares that, quote, gardening is healthy for your body and spirit. Shoveling and tending plants keep you healthy, just like physical exercise. Every day I to do on the garden, but I enjoy working on the garden since it makes me feel comfortable and happy. Furthermore, raising vegetables and herbs uh, from the whole garden, uh, with one serving for the family uh, to use to consume, uh, and two or three servings to give to us friends make me happy. And of quote. So as she indicated, uh, Bak Dewitt Farm is an avid gardener, is delighted with home home garden and what she has planted and raised. Uh, she is proud, and it should be. Uh, of the amazing um, garden she has cultivated, particularly the elongated gourds that she have cultivated in her home garden. So uh, let me show you a few photos, starting with uh, some green papayas uh, being grown here by Winland um, in their former um, back, well, in their former um, home uh, backyard in Pearland, Texas. So you can see these enormous papayas. So you can see the scale as uh, Winland squatting next to uh, the papayas that she had grown. Uh, here's another photo of Winland, uh, which was also used in the uh, Edward Houston article. So she's standing right next to um, some uh, bitter melons, which I, I still don't get. I mean, I have tried bitter melons a few times, and um, for me, it's an acquired taste. So it is quite bitter. Um, now, some may may like the uh, distal taste of it, uh, and it is healthy for you, uh, but uh, for me, it's, it's still an acquired taste. So you have white eggplants. This is from uh, my parents' backyard. So almost every year they would cultivate white eggplants and they would use white eggplants uh, to make certain dishes as well as uh, to enhance uh, certain condiments. Uh, my mother-in-law, uh, Chen Lung, so here she's probably holding uh, uh, the uh, Vidao, the winter melon, fuzzy winter squash melon that she cultivated. Uh, this is her friend, uh, Bach. Uh, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is a, uh, 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 Goi Din Lee uh, and her husband. Sorry, I, I forgot to include the photo of uh, Bach in, in her garden. But uh, this is uh, their garden in Arlington, Texas. They also uh, grow white eggplants, uh, as well as a number of elongated gourds and also bitter melons. All right, uh, now I want to shift over to uh, emancipatory food ways and uh, talk a little bit uh, about food sovereignty, homeland duality, foreign citizenship. And also just briefly mention about the Vietnamese villages in Houston, Texas. In other words, you have condominiums in Southeast Houston um, clustered around the Park Place neighborhood that, uh, and then these are working class neighborhoods, by the way, and you have uh, Vietnamese Americans who are part of that working class and uh, they're, they're struggling to, to make a, a living, but nevertheless, they would uh, find whatever small spaces that they could utilize to cultivate their own home gardens. And they would be resourceful in utilizing uh, whatever uh, materials uh, they could gain access to, such as cardboard boxes, uh, empty bathtubs that have been abandoned. Uh, even um, uh, <laughs> it's an it's early voting season. So even um, political campaign signs would be utilized 
uh, to cover uh, some of the, the fruits and uh, the herbs. Uh, now, uh, these home gardens uh, were cultivated or continue to be cultivated by Vietnamese residents uh, in these villages like Pai Suan, uh, Da La, Saigon, Hue, Kantam, the St. Chosen villages. And this act of gardening is part of their working class ethos, right? To not only survive and assist, uh, but also to gain access to fresh fruits, herbs, and fruits, uh, fresh, I'm sorry, fruits, herbs, and vegetables. And again, uh, their gardens will serve as a homeland reminder uh, in a positive uh, in-between or liminal space. And it is a political act uh, to gain food security. Uh, so food sovereignty what's control over what they consume and what they could cook with and uh, to protect and preserve uh, and expand the food heritage to the next generation of Vietnamese Americans. Uh, and so you have uh, these concepts like food sovereignty, homeland duality, and culinary citizenship, which I'll get into in just a moment. These are uh, emancipatory food ways, right? They free them uh, not only uh, in terms of um, dealing with uh, the, the, the continuing traumas of war, exile, relocation, and, um, and, uh, and racialization in the United States, but also uh, to help uh, them gain uh, access, right, to organic, um, healthy greens, uh, fruits, and, and vegetables. So let's talk a little bit more about emancipatory food ways. Such home gardens uh, help Vietnamese Texans build their sense of place, unity, and camaraderie. Their home gardens and familiar produce give them the opportunity to build a community and be good neighbors. For Vietnamese historians residing in working class neighborhoods with limited spatiality, uh, limited spaces which grow gardens and micro farms, they make the most of what they have and convert such constricted spaces into positive places of food sovereignty and security. For Vietnamese historians, the herbs, vegetables, and fruit trees grown in the yards are critical for preparing traditional Vietnamese dishes and sauces, as well as preserving the flavors, tastes, textures, and smells of the food they consumed when they were living in Vietnam. Even with limited resources and land for the home gardens, they have created spaces where they can achieve food sovereignty, remember their homeland, and establish culinary citizenship. They are preserving and expanding Vietnamese food ways while introducing them to the non-Vietnamese populace. The home gardens are not proverbial Garden of Edens. They are more. They are home. By growing, nurturing, picking, and cooking, and consuming the vegetables, herbs, and fruits from their home gardens, Vietnamese Texans establish a homeland duality, planting, planting their culinary roots in the Texas soil with produce that remind them of Vietnam. Thus, homeland duality applies to the Vietnamese diaspora experience of rooting themselves here in the United States by cultivating small plots of home gardens or safe, positive spaces, which in turn help them stay rooted to the old Vietnam. Here, I argue that Vietnamese Texas home gardens also practice culinary citizenship, where they utilize fresh herbs, fruits, and vegetables plucked from their gardens as essential ingredients to prepare and cook Vietnamese meals. Such meals are consumed communally with family and loved ones. Consequently, traditional Vietnamese dishes, flavors, textures, and smells are remembered, extended, and experimented to expand Vietnamese food ways. This aids them in ascertaining a homeland duality in the United States present, and in a trans-historical place across time and space, a place that embodies living evidence of the Vietnam, and more specifically, South Vietnam past. Despite challenges to gardening in the Texas heat, as well as the time and labor spent, uh, Win Vietnam believes that gardening helps the Vietnamese in the United States maintain a part of their tradition. Quote, and I read this quote earlier, this is an effort to preserve and extend of our ancestors. The Vietnamese, when leaving the homeland, promised to themselves to preserve and develop and culture, end of quote. My father, Wu Kirang Kwan, believes that gardening gives them, quote, a greater sense of a mother. Quote. For Vietnamese Texans, their home gardens have given them the freedom to remember, rebuild, reconnect, uh, I'm sorry, and reconnect with their Vietnamese culture. They have transitioned from living in refuge to living in resistance, a resistance to dominant food culture that was alien to them. Their work with the soil has provided ingredients that are elemental to Vietnamese food culture. With them, they cook, I'm sorry, with them, they cook comforting meals. For the families, and that also introduced their neighbors to a rich and diverse cuisine that is vital to Vietnamese historians' survival, oneness, and identity. All right, so a few more photos from the Vietnamese villages. This one's back book from uh, the uh, Thai Swan village uh, near Hobby Airport. This is from Saigon Village, and uh, again, this is in Southeast Houston. This one's near Park Place neighborhood, or in the Park Place neighborhood, excuse me. Uh, another, this is a cluster home guard. Uh, so these condiments are fairly small, right? And as you see, the spaces are fairly limited. 
And so whatever uh, green spaces they could find or whatever empty lots they could find, they would transform them into small, beautiful gardens. Uh, here you have uh, some lufa uh, being cultivated. And again, just using to have. And again, these gardens may be small, but they're beautiful. And you can see here in this one uh, particular home garden uh, at St. Joseph Village, uh, you have um, a beautiful garden with an array of vegetables uh, being cultivated here. Uh, and in some cases you have uh, gardens that would stretch uh, up uh, alongside uh, railways, right? Uh, along uh, rails uh, upstairs uh, and underneath uh, stair uh, stairwells as well. Again, you see whatever uh, resources are available or that have been abandoned, left behind. So here you have grocery carts and political signs being used uh, to cultivate this small garden. So in conclusion, um, on foreign soil, the daily practice of cultivating food rewards immigrants and refugees opportunity to create a sense of rootedness on their own terms. They can shape the world by growing and cooking their own foods. Through this food sovereignty, immigrants and refugees not only regain some food security, but also their food heritage. For Vietnamese Texans, planting herbs, vegetables, and home gardening allows them to develop a process of culinary citizenship that preserves and expands Vietnamese cuisine for themselves while simultaneously enriching U.S. food waste. People nurture their food roots to live a more dignified life, a life that does not completely escape the traumas of war, migration, resettlement, and marginalization, but rather their food roots are emancipatory food ways that help redefine their lives as new Americans living beyond such haunting memories. Um, renowned sociologist uh, Pierrette Ndangu Sotelo really argues that, quote, gardens can serve as mini zones of autonomy, as sites and practices of transcendence and restoration. Gardens offer compensation for lost worlds, bringing moments of pleasure, tranquility, and beauty, and they articulate future possibilities. The cultivation of particular flowers, herbs, vegetables, and fruits forges critical connections to cultural memory and homeland, providing a narrative of home continuity and familiarity that's particularly meaningful for immigrants from rural pre-industrial societies, end of quote. So Hanagi Sotelo poorly describes the homeland connections made by recent uh, Latinx immigrants in Los Angeles when they plant and raise community gardens. Such homeland connections are also made by diasporans, uh, like the Vietnamese diaspora, when they cultivate home gardens in the front and backyards, uh, on small parcels of land surrounding the aging, the aging condo buildings they reside, or even on shared public spaces. Through homeland connections with the gardens and micro farms, Vietnamese texts and planters unearth a homeland duality by their own court. They are defining the conditions of belonging here in Texas, as well as reconnecting to their Vietnam by growing herbs, vegetables, and fruit trees familiar to them. Such gardens and produce also assist them to heal emotionally and physically from the scars of war, abandonment, displacement, and racialization. With the gardens and produce, they're linking to an old homeland while, simu while simultaneously establishing a new place to call home. These personal home gardens serve as physical culinary contact where they interact not only with nature, but also socialize uh, with their fellow village residents or nearby neighbors by exchanging seed tips and produce and sharing their interests, stories, and latest news. The home gardens and micro farms cultivated by Vietnamese diasporans are physical evidence and attributes of how they wish to live a Vietnamese life in America, a life that was violently disrupted, abandoned, and lost uh, from the war, refuge, relocation, marginalization, but now partially revived, reclaimed, and redeemed with their hands transforming the soil into their own small treasure plot of homeland. That is at once two homelands. And so here in the conclusion, as you can see, gardens are places of nurturing, healing, and freedom uh, from the dis body disruptions of war, displacement, relocation, racialization. Gardening is a communal act for many uh, Vietnamese home gardeners. Gardening encourages wellness and farm table praxis. Gardening uh, is also a working class uh, ethos, as I mentioned earlier. And as I mentioned earlier too, gardening is a political act to secure fresh food, reclaim food sovereignty, resist dominant food processes, and preserve its strength and expand Vietnamese these foodways. And gardening is an act of uh, belonging and longing, right? As they long for Vietnam, they're also trying to belong here in the United States. And finally, gardening uh, uh, as roots to food sovereignty, homeland duality, and colonial citizenship are part of emancipatory food ways. So that concludes my presentation for today. Thank you again for your attendance, and uh, thank you.
Megan and Carol and Urban Houston once more, Urban Harvest of Houston once more, for inviting me to give this presentation today. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Vu. I love that culinary citizenship idea and that concept. Oh, so thank you so much. Um, wonderful. Well, we have time for questions from anyone who is in the um, audience and happy to either have you unmute yourself and ask your question, or of course, you're welcome to use the chat and I'm happy to read it out loud. And um, I know that there are students of Dr. Vu and Professor Vu as well. So if they have maybe questions, of course, I encourage them as well to ask. <laughs> and I know that um, Lauren did say that the gardens are beautiful and she's amazed by how much veggies that they can grow in Texas. <laughs> ah, thank you, Lauren. Oh, she's one of my students. So thank you, Lauren. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Good. Does anyone have questions for Professor Booth? <laughs> um, well, I have a question of, um, of, in your introduction, you said that you were uh, walking in honor of indigenous people and, uh, and you named a specific tribe. And I'm assuming that's a tri that is a tribe of Texas. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that and it specifically which region of, Oh, okay, uh, great, of the yes. Americans, like of the origins of the indigenous people you referenced. Uh, also, I reference it to the Akokisa uh, tribe from the southeastern part of Texas, uh, as well as uh, the um, western portion of southern, uh, what does it say, southern Louisiana. Uh, and so for me, it's just the uh, beginning of my journey to try to uh, make land acknowledgments to indigenous peoples. And uh, and I'm, I'm not the one who, who invented uh, these land acknowledgments. I mean, this has uh, actually been going on, uh, for instance, in academia, like in academic conferences for uh, quite a while now. And uh, for me, it's just another way to try to pay my honor and respect uh, to those who came before us. Does that, I hope that answers your question. Oh, it, it does. It does because um, Adan Madrano, I just saw his documentary of Truly oh. Texas Mexican. And so okay. that was, uh, uh, indigenous people who are in the northern Mexico and um, mm. uh, western Texas uh, okay, region of the focus. Yes, I have this book. Uh, it's it's a, a cookbook slash history book on uh, Texas uh, uh, Mexican cuisine. Uh, I haven't seen a documentary yet, so I, I do need to watch uh, the documentary. So thank you for making that suggestion. Sure, sure. And I do have a question. Um, relating to uh, your presentation and speaking of the Vietnamese community who first came, which were, who were uh, our parents and you came as a young boy. And so now with the, the newer generation and the millennials, like the offspring. So how do you witness their connection to culture? Because they grew up with very strong roots of food sovereignty and connection to food and gardens. And so how do you see that play out with the, with the new generation. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I was uh, conversing with, with Megan earlier. So I, I don't see, personally, I haven't seen too many uh, younger Vietnamese Americans, you know, with my generation or even younger, cultivating home gardens. But I have, uh, I, I do have, for instance, uh, a cousin who uh, has started home gardening uh, since the pandemic. And so she's been growing home um, backyard garden uh, for the last two years. and. And so it's, it's great to see uh, younger folks um, cultivating herbs, uh, fruit trees and, and vegetables, particularly those that are familiar to uh, the Vietnamese people and are you know, uh, commonly consumed, right? And, and, uh, and so I think hopefully that, that traditional food way will, will, will live on. Um, as far as people I've interviewed in Houston and in the Dallas Worth area, they are, they are of the older generation. Uh, and so that is, uh, yeah, that's something to be concerned about for sure, because you wonder if these traditional food ways like home gardening uh, of herbs, fruit trees, vegetables would, would, uh, slowly, uh, would slowly go away, would slowly die. And so you hope that such traditional food ways would not completely go away. And I think, uh, and I, I'm new to urban harvest, but uh, th that's why I think uh, you know, um, urban harvest is its mission, right? To provide these classes, not just Zoom classes, but also in-person classes coming up soon. Uh, to teach others how to garden and cultivate fresh fruits 
herbs and vegetables, it's, it's vital, it's very important, right? Particularly in an urban setting. Uh, and I think um, it, it's also important because it allows us the opportunity to only learn about gardening and improve our health, but, but also uh, in, in a lot of ways, we connect with our traditional food ways. And so I think that's something to be of concern about. And, and the same can be said about the Vietnamese language, right? And so you do have this concern that for the, you know, for my generation and, and, and the younger generation of Vietnamese Americans, um, yeah, I mean, you, you, we're concerned about the loss of language, right? And my Vietnamese isn't up to par. I mean, uh, I can converse in Vietnamese, but that's about it. Uh, and so I'm not fluent in Vietnamese. Um, and so it's just, it's, uh, and, and my first language was actually Vietnamese. Um, I didn't learn English until I was in kindergarten. But that said, I mean, over the years, I've, I've lost the ability to be to be fluent in, in Vietnamese. Um, and so uh, there are some positive news. Uh, and that is, for instance, do you do begin to see more and more Vietnamese language courses, even VSL or Vietnamese as a second language courses at uh, institutions like Houston Community College and University of Houston, which I'm, I'm proud to say that I, I played a part in helping establish the, the uh, first Vietnamese uh, studies and, and language courses at University of Houston back in 2005, 2006. Um, and I wasn't the only one. I mean, there were many others who helped us. So I only played a part. That's it, it's my part. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm proud to play a, a role in establishing such a program at University of Houston. So the same thing can be said with language uh, and the same thing can be said with gardening. And it's, um, yeah, I mean, you hope it doesn't go away. And, and that's, as I mentioned Megan earlier, uh, I definitely need to learn how to garden. Uh, again, I'm not a gardener. Uh, but I do like to uh, hear other people's stories, um, and I like to hear their stories in this case of why uh, they choose to garden and why they would uh, cultivate uh, certain fruits and uh, certain fruit trees and and herbs and and uh, and vegetables and and why it's so important to them, right? And why gardening uh, heals them in, in many in many ways. Uh, and so for me, it's it's more about the why rather than rather than the how uh, of the story and so it's um uh, but nevertheless yeah um for for me and, and um, my friends and um my my cousins in my church yeah i mean it's important for us to try to uh up, uphold uh, these traditional food ways such as backyard gardening mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great Thank you so much for that. Um, I think we have a couple other questions that I know there are some folks that ask gardening specific questions. <laughs> oh no, okay, don't ask me, ask Megan and Carol. Uh, um, so we'll talk about the gigantic papayas in a second, but I do wanna speak to Naomi's <laughs> question that you can't answer. Um, so Naomi is asking, how much of is the act of gardening restricted by HOAs or dominant landscaping aesthetics, et cetera, in Texas? And do you see Vietnamese gardeners finding workarounds like the front yard gardens or maybe some of the examples you showed? And do you see any difference in gardening practice between working and middle-class folks? So sorry, that's two questions. The first is the HOAs and dominant landscaping aesthetics. Is there any um, kind of restrictions that you've seen gardeners face? All right, uh, more excellent questions. Wow, so this is a great line of the audience. I, I appreciate the questions. Uh, keep sending keep sending them our way, so I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, as far as the first one, well, um, you, you do have, uh, uh, <laughs> I like to term renegade gardening uh, in some of these villages in the past uh, where they would see uh, an abandoned lot or they'll see, um, you know, um, a, a green space that haven't been utilized, but maybe a public space, and they'll convert that to a micro farm. And uh, they have been in trouble in the past versus residents of St. Joseph Village, I want to say this back in 2000, mid 2000s um they were uh, ordered uh, to uproot and remove uh, the their their gardens uh that they cultivated along sims bayou in southeast houston uh and so uh that to um, um, destroy destroy the gardens uh, unfortunately um but as far as uh, vietnamese uh, americans in uh, in these um, working class neighborhoods like in southeast houston for them whatever spaces they find they, they would guard it if they Unfortunately, if they, if they um, are in trouble or in violation of any nature, then uh, they, yes, they would have to destroy the gardens. Uh, but it shows or demonstrates, I believe, that they're, um, they're, they're, they're proactive, right? Attempts to use whatever spaces are available and resources are available to cultivate these home gardens, right? Uh, now, of course, in middle-class neighborhoods uh, and upper-middle-class neighborhoods, you have, of course, 
uh, neighborhood associations, HOAs, and so they have more strict rules. And so uh, there are um, uh, fewer opportunities, right, uh, to do rent and gate guarding, as I would say. Uh, so, so as a result, uh, like for my parents, they live in a working class area, but you could say it's, I guess, the lower middle class. Um, I mean, for all the years of guarding, they have received zero complaints about the fruit trees they've cultivated in the front yard. Uh, and of course, uh, they would cultivate uh, fruit trees in the backyard too. I mean, they have grown, for instance, banana trees, uh, and you can see them clearly uh, from outside, right, from uh, yards away. Uh, and so, I think it's it's again, if you're in a working class neighborhood, um, you can get away with more, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, but in a middle class or upper middle class neighborhood, then of course there are there are stricter rules uh, that uh, residents must abide. And so as a result, you're not going to see as many right, home gardens. Uh, but that said, that leads to the second question, right? As far as differences in garden practices between working and middle-class folks, uh, not a great question. So as far as uh, middle-class folks, like uh, I have an aunt who lives in a, in a you know, pr pretty good, you know, well-to-do middle-class, pretty affluent middle-class family, in, in, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, neighborhood in, uh, in Arlington. And and uh, they, we used the entire backyard uh, to cultivate herbs, um, fruit trees, and so forth. But uh, they would not use their front yard uh, to cultivate uh, such things. And so, uh, again, it's um, using a little bit of stealth, right? And a little bit of um, making sure that what they're cultivating isn't uh, an eyesore for their neighbors uh, and isn't an eyesore for, the, for their HOA. Uh, and so th there's a difference. Uh, I agree there's a difference between guarding practices between working class and middle class folks. Uh, working class folks, uh, at least the ones I've interviewed uh, and met, they tend to utilize whatever spaces they can find uh, and, and cultivate gardens and, and see if, if that's okay with everyone. And if it isn't, then yes, they have to destroy such, um, such crops. But uh, it's again, a very, very proactive uh, approach of, of gardening. Whereas middle class folks are more reserved, of course, and they have to abide by HOA rules. Great, great question. Um, so one, well, we have Ruth was asking about the lemon grass repelling snakes or not, and I don't, I'm not actually sure. Carol, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not um, sure. Sorry. But can you tell us a little bit more about your new book? Oh yes, yeah. so. Uh, it's called Farm to Freedom, Bees, Bags, and Home Gardens. And it's currently under contract with Texas A&M University Press. And it's about Vietnamese Texans and their home gardens. And I explore the concepts of emancipatory foodways, uh, such as, uh, well, emancipatory foodway concepts, such as homeland duality, food sovereignty, and culinary citizenship. And I focus mainly um, uh, on uh, Vietnamese Americans living in the Houston area, as well as in the VFW area, in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Uh, and so it's um, it's basically it's it's like my presentation, but scaled up into a manuscript. Uh, and I uh, also, of course, uh, have a lot of photos. I hope that they will use uh, photos of uh, not only Vietnamese American home gardeners here in the U.S., but also photos uh, that I've, I've um, where, uh, uh, was fortunate to access at archives, like at the University of California, Irvine, uh, in their Southeast Asian archive there, uh, and I. Just photos of uh, British refugees cultivating gardens in refugee camps, right? Uh, as uh, they uh, uh, would uh, uh, wait uh, and see if they are granted political asylum. Sometimes, again, as I mentioned, they would wait for months, even years to gain political asylum, right? Uh, and so there's this chronic uncertainty that they would have to live with uh, for days and weeks, right? Uh, and so one way to help them not only pass the time, but uh, to uh, to survive and, and to ease their anxiety and, and fear, uh, one one way would be to cultivate gardens, right? Uh, and so that we use whatever refugee camp spaces are available to cultivate these gardens. And so in my book, uh, I, I talk a great deal about uh, Vietnamese uh, refugees in their gardens and refugee camps throughout Southeast Asia as well. And I go all the way back, of course, to Vietnam and how Vietnamese uh, would cultivate kitchen gardens um, even before the war and, and during the war. Uh, and so it's basically a scallop version of this presentation. But thank you for your interest. I, I truly appreciate your interest um, about my book project.
Hmm, that's great. Um, a question that I think that you can answer. Um, what's the easiest or most popular vegetable or herb that you saw um, folks growing? Or maybe you mentioned, but. Uh, there's, there's several. One was bitter melons, which again, I cannot uh, stand, but um, <laughs> not, not to my wife, but but uh, yeah, it's a question. I mean, a lot of people would love bitter melons and, and they would, uh, you know, uh, turn it, I do use bitter melons and, and make a soup out of it. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's it, and of course it's very healthy for you as well. Mm-hmm. So it's a bit of balance right up there along with, um, as far as uh, herbs for condiments, right? Like uh, like water spinach, like a raw uh, as well as um, uh, the uh, the perla, the mints, you know, raw tongue that they would use to, uh, use as uh, garnishes for, for pho and, mm-hmm. and for bowen. And so those are very quite commonly grown. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would say water spinach and, 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 and uh, variety of mints as well as perla. Lemongrass uh, is 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 grown uh, um, pretty often, yeah, pretty often, pretty frequently. Mm-hmm. Uh, not as often as I would say like raw thyme, uh, and and you don't have gaya too. They don't have chili peppers, uh, so chili pepper trees, right? Uh, to uh, that they were used to not only enhance the flavors of dishes and and sauces, but also to to consume raw, which I wouldn't recommend uh, unless you eat really spicy food. Uh, you eat spice, but not not at that level. I can't consume, uh, for instance, Thai chili peppers raw. Um, my wife can, but, but I can't. Um, so yeah, so I would say all those Great. things. Great. And um, to follow up on that, what to what degree are people planting certain plants for just medicinal um, purposes? So you mentioned the herbs, um, but were there medicinal plants or medical reasons? That's another great question. And by the way, I, I like uh, your statement, Megan, horticulture therapy. I need to write that Oh, down. yes. So that's that's yes. great. Um, yeah, as far as medicinal purposes, uh, not only to, you know, of course, consuming uh, organically grown uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, it's healthy for you, but but also in terms of, say, uh, cultivating like uh, aloe vera plants, right? My mom has her own aloe vera plants in, in the backyard that she would use, um, you know, for medicinal purposes or, or, or to um, to help with her skin condition, right? Uh, so uh, you have that. And then in terms uh, of... Um, other medicinal uses. This is a great question because I don't know too much about medicinal usage of uh, herbs and, and plants, uh, but that's just one example. Um, and as far as other examples, I can't think of anything else on top of my head. Um, now that's it. I mean, you, you do uh, for those who uh, for those who are um, are, are, are know a great deal about uh, Vietnamese culture, particularly medicinal culture. You still see uh, a lot of uh, homeopathic practices, right? Uh, by uh, Vietnamese refugees and immigrants to this very day. And so they'll combine, you know, using Western medicine as well as uh, traditional medical practices for Vietnam, uh, uh, home remedies, in other words, uh, that they will use uh, to make themselves feel better. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, as far as, gosh, I can't think of any other uh, herbs, uh, specific herbs uh, that were used for medicinal purposes. I, I, I'm sure there, there are a few, but. I'm sorry, I just can't think of the top of my head right now. It's a great question. That's okay. Um, do the Vietnamese gardens that you've seen include also ornamentals like flowers and shrubs that are maybe not edible? Sure, absolutely. Uh, and so, yeah, as far as um, some of these Vietnamese back home gardens, they would cultivate um, you know, a variety of flowers, um, you know, roses, some would cultivate tulips, uh, uh, some would uh, also have um, uh, cultivate trees like uh, you know like, like apple blossoms that um, uh, yeah that uh, that are not only um, uh, well really really for, for decorative reasons uh, and so you have um, I don't we're causing well yeah I don't, sorry, I don't think other, um, decorative plants that are cultivated. but yes you do see decorative gardens as well uh, where you have rose bushes being cultivated right next to a plot of uh, raw water or, or water spinach being being cultivated so yes you do see some recreational gardening or decorative gardening by Vietnamese Americans great um, one of our last questions I think here just for time as well um, do people's gardens get bad reputations or feedback from non-Vietnamese communities for being maybe quote-unquote invasive or anything to that nature wow that's a great question I don't know um, as far as bad reputation I mean again going back to so-called renegade gardening right uh, uh, 
someone reported, right, uh, to authorities about uh, the Vietnamese Americans, uh, the Vietnamese residents at St. Joseph Village and, and their um, illegal gardening, right, along Sims Bayou. And so um, for Vietnamese uh, residents in that village, right, be, being part of the working class, uh, they thought that since it was unused land, right, uh, why not turn them into beautiful uh, gardens filled with, you know, complete with herbs and fruit trees and so forth. Um, and so, like I said, that's one incident uh, where unfortunately you did have uh, some negative feedback uh, from non vietnamese communities, right, uh, for planting gardens uh, where they're not supposed to. Um, and so, yes, uh, to answer your question, yes. Uh, but as far as bad reputation, um, I I would say a bad reputation. I, I think nowadays, in particular, uh, particularly in recent years, and, and with the younger generation, uh, there's been more um, more of a positive feedback in regards to gardening, in regards to cultivating your own fruit trees, vegetables, and, and herbs, right? And so, uh, I, I think nowadays it has more of a positive connotation, including for uh, Vietnamese Americans in their home gardens, right? So I haven't heard of any serious complaints other than the example I, I mentioned during, uh, oh, during uh, this Q&A session. Great. Awesome. I hope that, I hope, yeah, right. I hope that stays that way, right? Um, right, absolutely. Hopefully that stays that way. Yeah. So how can folks keep in touch with you? Oh, uh, great. Uh, great. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for asking. Yes. Uh, so my email address, I can type it right here. Is uh, this, I'll give you my work email address. It's rvu at dccd.edu. Uh, and uh, you can email me. Um, let me go ahead and give you my Gmail address as well. rvu at gmail. Those are two email, email addresses that I check daily uh, when I'm at home. So please feel free to email me and uh, feel free to ask me more questions. I'll try my best to answer them. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for your interest and thank you for being here virtually, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, love your questions, love your comments. I see some comments here. We're going to put in front of maybe laundry containers. It's a good idea. So um, yeah, I'm just grateful for this opportunity to talk a little bit about Vietnamese uh, food ways and uh, in particularly Vietnamese Americans and what they cultivate in their yards. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you all. If I did not answer your question, please uh, let us know right now. Um, otherwise, yeah, there's some great comments if you're able to scroll up, um, Dr. Vu, and read those. Um, yeah, I'll just make sure. Okay, thank you so much um, for being part of this uh, celebration this month of Asian heritage and for your presentation. I learned a lot. Um, and hopefully everyone is inspired from the work that you've been doing and the kind of historical and cultural importance of Vietnamese gardens. So thank you.